So welcome friends, I'm John, Father John Deere, and welcome to this Beatitude Center Zoom session with our very special guest today, my friend Larry Rasmussen. You can find many other great upcoming Zooms at www.beatitudecenter.org. First, again, let me ask everyone who's live with us today to mute themselves and also to write any questions that you have in the chat link. Uh, Larry, I hope we'll speak for 45 minutes or so, and then we'll open it up to questions and comments and discussion for about uh, 45 minutes, and we will then send out the Zoom recording link in a few days. So let's begin with a little prayer, and I invite everyone to take a moment of silence, and let's enter into the presence of our beloved God of peace, who loves each one of you infinitely, and let's welcome the risen nonviolent Jesus into our hearts, to our circle here, and ask for all the graces of life and love and peace and justice that we need for ourselves and all of creation. Creator God, thank you for all the blessings of life and love and peace that you give us, most especially we thank you for all the creatures and Mother Earth and all of your glorious creation. Be with us now and bless us as we reflect on how we might better follow the nonviolent Jesus in this time of catastrophic climate change. Inspire us, bless us, and send us forth as we listen to Larry, that we might do your will and live out your Beatitudes and Sermon on the Mount that we might speak out and take action against environmental destruction and systemic injustice and for sustainability for all creation, that we might better follow the nonviolent Jesus and welcome your reign of peace and justice and um, protection for creation here and now on earth. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. So uh, again, dear friends, mm -hmm. welcome. And I'm glad that you're all here, and I'm happy to introduce to you my friend Larry Rasmussen, who's one of the world's leading environmental theologians, who's going to reflect with us today on following the nonviolent Jesus in this time of catastrophic climate change. Um, Larry Rasmussen is the Reinhold Niebuhr Professor Emeritus of Social Ethics at Union Theological Seminary in New York City. Um, our mutual friend Cornell West, uh, who will be doing a Zoom with us in September, calls Larry one of the leading ethicists on the planet. It's very high praise. <laughs> Larry's new book is The Planet You Inherit, Letters to My Grandchildren When Uncertainty is a Sure Thing. And I really recommend that everybody gets it. There he asks the question, what kind of planet do our children and grandchildren have a right to expect from us? very powerful. He's written many other books. His 2013 book, Earth Honoring Faith, Religious Ethics in a New Key, published by Oxford, received the famous Nautilus Gold Prize and the Nautilus Grand Prize for best 2014 book overall, which is amazing. An earlier volume, Earth Community, Earth Ethics, won the really prestigious uh, Grauemeyer Award in Religion in 1997. Larry served as a member of the Science, Ethics, and Religion Advisory Committee of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and was a recipient of the Henry Luce Fellowship in Theology and the Fellman Award for Distinguished Christian Ministries in Higher Education and the Joseph Sittler Award for Outstanding Leadership in Theological Education and the UNITAS Award from Union Theological Seminary. I'm telling you this so that you know what a privilege it is to listen to Larry today. From 1990 to 2000, he served as co-moderator of the World Council of Churches Unit on Justice, Peace, and Creation. He was the organizer of the decade-long project on Earth Honoring, Honoring Faith here in New Mexico at Ghost Ranch from 2008 to 2017. And in the spring semester of 2018, he was guest professor at Yale University Divinity School. He's also taught at Cambridge in University in England. 
and has re was granted recently the Lifetime Achievement Award of the Society of Christian Ethics. Wow. And he has a website at LarryWrites.com, I think. Larry lives in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and I'm coming to you from Santa Fe, New Mexico, where I'm staying for a month. I'm here in the public library down the road from Larry, and it's a gorgeous, hot, going to be windy day. And um, dear friends, join me in giving a big, warm welcome to a great, great voice for creation, uh, Larry Rasmussen. The floor is yours, Larry. Oh, very yeah. warm welcome. <laughs> Thank you, and, and a huge thanks to, to Father John uh, for this series. I'm honored to join you and pleased uh, that you've tuned in for this time together. Um, for this year's World Day of Prayer for the Care of Creation, Pope Francis calls for an end to what he calls the fossil fuel era saying that it is, quote, madness to continue, much less expand, the infrastructure of fossil fuels. That's part of his prayer, the message for the prayer day. He issued uh, this message a day before the eighth anniversary of the landmark environmental encyclical that you all know about, Laudato Si thereby making a direct link of the global economy powered by fossil fuel to that landmark encyclical. I'm <clears throat> Laudato Si and his World Day of Prayer message belong to the papal effort to cultivate what he calls the culture of nonviolence. And I'm joining uh, the Pope's efforts at that. I'm trying to do so by way of letters to my grandchildren in the book uh, that Father John mentioned, The Planet You Inherit. The specific audience, uh, in addition to the grandkids, is millennials and Generation Z. That's the folks born after 1990 or before. Yeah, no, after 1990. Now, these young adults know full well the planetary plight that they're inheriting, and it terrifies them. They are certain uh, the planet is unsustainable, unfair, unstable, and violent, climate violent. Don't be surprised then that a recent poll finds 50% of Generation Z youth feeling that they are doomed. And on a family note, three of my grandnieces who are Generation Zers have decided they will not bring children into this doomed world. As a voice among these youth, I'm going to read a poem by my granddaughter, uh, Leave, Dears Parsons. Leave just turned 17. She performed this poem at the New York City launch of the, the book, The Planet You Inherit. The poem titled, You Can't Shift the Stars, is Leave Seeing the World by way of a seven-year-old girl awake to earth and her dreams for it. So here's the poem, you can't shift the stars. In her childhood dreams, she holds on to the earth, stops the bleeding with her own two hands. A little girl sits on her bedroom floor, head tilted toward the stars and imagines she could shift them Reform the heavens into perfection. Reshape the sky till it reflects a prettier world. Maybe everyone is a god at seven years old. To the little girl dreaming of change from her bedroom floor, writing novels in her head between darkness and sleep, 
because little girls' minds run wild and the world is so vast and you are so small and who will be there to save it when it all burns down? Because it is burning, isn't it? The TV said it is. And mama can't explain how they're going to fix it. And you thought mama could mend anything. You believed in perfection and infinity. It all seemed so clear from your bedroom floor. Just tell the leaders to get down from their podiums, crawl on the floor till they remember their childhood. Play in the dirt, pick the flowers, swing from the trees, remind them what they're losing, remind them what they're burning. After all, who could look the earth in her eyes, in her eyes and tell her goodbye? But you watch the TV and the leaders are stuck at their podiums and they have forgotten what it feels like to be a child. And you can never play God and you will never shift the heavens. But I hope you know I carry your dreams in my lungs. I breathe in deeply. Your hope makes a home in my stomach. It hugs the tired parts of me till they sprout new dandelions. Did you know you are a garden? You have watered yourself since childhood's painstakingly with love and laughter, even on the days, especially on the days when hope seems impossible. There is a garden within you. There is a world within you. There is a galaxy within you. But it is up to you to find it. Take out your pen, take out your paintbrush, Take out your camera, take out your megaphone, and you will discover that the littlest things can be a revolution. You can't stop the bleeding, you can't shift the stars, but you will discover love is powerful. Our voices are powerful. Our stories are powerful. We are powerful. A little girl on her own can't reshape the universe, but a movement sure can. That's the end of Leave's poem. And Leave, through this seven-year-old's voice, knows that without a love and hope movement, the kids are doomed. They're doomed if grown-ups don't have a garden within and a galaxy and don't understand that the little things count big. I'd call this a movement for a culture of nonviolence. <clears throat> now here's another, and I see my one grandson, John Asante here. He wasn't able to be with his mom at uh, the New York launch, but here's another voice from that New York launch of the planet you inherit. It's a very short speech <clears throat> by my grandson, Eduardo Erasmuson Villegas. He's eight and he's a second grader. His words were these, dear grandpa, thanks for sharing your wisdom in the letter you wrote to me and Spud. Spud is my nickname for his younger brother. I hope that wisdom flows through our blood. That's, that's an, a line from what I'm sure is an overdose of Harry Potter. Wisdom flowing through our blood. And Ed, Eduardo goes on, some people on our planet are doing the best they can to save it, but climate change is bad. It was very interesting learning about your life. My life in the Anthropocene's pretty decent so far. I've recently been learning about the planet, geography, especially the Arctic and Antarctic. I hope they don't melt away. Love, Eduardo. 
P.S. In the first chapter, it means the first chapter of the book, Epic Times, you write, I can't read it yet, but I'm already reading chapter books without pictures. <laughs> now, now, all of you, think back to your own second grade and compare it to Eduardo's. Did you study melting polar ice caps? Did you applaud some people for trying to save the planet because climate change is bad? Did you know the word Anthropocene? No, you knew none of this, nor did I. You didn't know and I didn't know because yours, my mind was a different planet. Uh, in one of his books, Bill McKibben's books, Father John's guest next week, McKibben even spells Earth differently, E double A R T H, in order to underscore that ours is now a different planet. <clears throat> Let me turn to the author's note in the book of letters to the grandkids. It sketches the framework. After that, I'm going to lay out the book's themes and then uh, turn to following Jesus in a clim amid climate catastrophe. All of this is to do one thing, to outline why a culture of nonviolence is mandatory for us. Here's the author's note. <clears throat> I knew my grandchildren confronted the harrowing challenge of moving from industrial to ecological civilization. The great transition is called epic times. I was ready for that. But my pen was startled to discover a truth that's taken us by stealth, that for the first time ever, humanity's become a geological force. We've slid off the back end of one geological epoch, the Holocene, onto the front end of another, the Anthropocene, the age of the human. Thus we face epoch times, epic times as well as epic times, and a further daunting transition. These transitions are the great work, that's from Thomas Berry, that awaits my grandchildren. Though they were never asked and didn't get a vote, remapping back, the world amidst uncertainty okay. is their calling as it is ours. While their world cannot be ours and shouldn't be, I wanted to step away from an academic career teaching social ethics and just write love letters. Love letters that face what they face in a changed and changing planet. I'm certain the letters are urgent, not because the grandparents are frail, but because their world is. That's the end of the author's note. But what is the Anthropocene? that my second greater grandson says has been pretty decent so far for him. The Anthropocene Greek for the age of the human, only God knows why all geologists speak Greek, but they do. Uh, the Anthropocene refers to the collective, cumulative and innovative human powers that are changing and redirecting planetary systems themselves. It's a rare mass event. Namely, this is a reset of evolution itself, now at our hands. I'll read a letter that describes the re recent consequence of these <clears throat> Anthropocene powers. Dear Martin, dear Eduardo, we now wield powers once reserved to the gods. As Stuart Brandt put it in 1968, we are as gods and might as well get good at it. Some years later, he became more emphatic. We are as gods and have to get good at it. Homo Deus, the god species, that's who we've become. 
were named that by big history writers like Yuval Noah Harari. Not by chance does Harari open his book, Homo Deus, with the Anthropocene as the very first chapter of part one. Part one itself is titled Homo sapiens conquers the world. Other parts are Homo sapiens gives meaning to the world, that's part two, and Homo sapiens loses control, that's part three. As I write, that's where we've landed. We're losing control, and notably, Harari has no part four to follow upon losing control. Evolution to this point, Harari says, has followed the unchanging principles of natural selection. Now, however, I'm quoting him, humankind is poised to replace natural selection with intelligent design, end of quote. Intelligent? Poised for that, perhaps, but thus far, this design has been too happenstance, too unplanned, and without smart, conscious, and shared intention. We manage planetary ecosystems more as a consequence of a way of life and powerful technologies than any careful deliberation about our collective and cumulative presence. That's accident rather than design, and it's not very intelligent. And to date, it's been globally violent. Biologist E.O. Wilson, the late biologist E.O. Wilson, is more skeptical than Brandt and Harari. Quote, we are not as gods. We're not yet sentient or intelligent enough to be much of anything, end quote. Martine, do you remember the remark by Richard Leakey in my earlier letter to you that we're the only species Richard Leakey knows who consistently makes bad decisions? But Harari is correct that our powers do take the evolutionary process beyond natural selection and any account of responsibility can only be truthful if it's sober about our powers on this novel scale. Assisted evolution is the going term for what we're doing as a co-evolutionary force of nature, but it's deceptive Assisted evolution hides the depth and breadth of the changes we're affecting. Would you have guessed from assisted evolution that our extra carbon would remake the world, alter marine chemistry, flood coastlines, strip glaciers to bare bones, embolden deserts, warp the circulation of ocean currents, supercharge extreme weather events, and rearrange the distribution of animal, plant, and microbial species around the globe. Would you have guessed that every major taxonomic group, animals, plants, fungi, and microorganisms is being driven down new evolutionary paths by human changes? Assisted evolution hardly tells you this. It's room temperature talk and doesn't reveal what recent sapiens, us, uh, have done. Namely, created no analog climates, no analog ecosystems, a whole new analog future. That's from Elizabeth Colbert's book, Under a White Sky. No analog is who we are and what the planet is. This hasn't sunk in yet, has it? The stakes are high since the question for Anthropocene powers is not whether we're going to further alter nature, but how and to what end. Could it be a nonviolent transformation? The moral stakes are as high as the practical ones. If Homo dominatus, that's late Holocene status, and humans as dominant, has become homo deus, that's Anthropocene reality, and if Earth is now without apology human empire, 
Does the iron rule of empires still hold? Namely, the rule that empires fall. Harari's part three, Homo sapiens loses control, might say, and I'm quoting him, yes, and wild and unruly nature assures us even less control, end quote. So the question isn't about our control of nature, but about the control of our control. How do we take responsibility for what control we do wield together with what we cannot control? The reality is that we are not exercising mastery as Lord of the Manor. That was the Enlightenment dream. Instead, we're binding ourselves more faithfully to ever, than ever to Earth as a single wild evolving force. There is no outside for us, no Archimedean point. Actually, there never was, as indigenous peoples have always known. In the past, there was only more room for error. It's rather ironic, isn't it, that just when we realize we're major players in a no analog world that we're creating, we find that we're a lot less important than we thought. Wild Earth can get along quite well without us, and for almost all of its life, it has. That's the end of the letter excerpt. Now, other letters contrast Anthropocene powers with what has gone before. Previous human powers did not revamp the chemistry of the atmosphere, air, the hydrosphere, water, nor did they revamp the cryosphere, the ice sphere, as polar caps, Greenland, all places of uh, permafrost. Previous powers did not wrinkle the Earth's crust either, the, the lithosphere, or bludgeon the community of life, the biosphere, with biodiversity loss and mass extinction. These collective and cumulative Anthropocene consequences are now complemented <clears throat> by the Anthropocene's innovative powers. Time allows me to just name two, and then maybe if you want, we can get into discussion of them later. Both were unprecedented uh, in previous epochs. One is sharply upgraded artificial intelligence, the AI you've been reading about in the news lately. No less than the creators of AI itself warn of an existential threat to humanity on a scale comparable to pandemics and nuclear war. 350 executives of AI companies say this in an open letter. Quote, mitigating the risk of extinction from AI should be a global priority alongside other society scale risks, such as pandemics and nuclear war. <clears throat> That's an awesome unholy trinity the AI CEO's name, pandemics, nuclear war, and AI. The other innovative power stems from discovering the code in which the book of life itself is written, namely DNA, and then sequencing all manner of genomes from bacteria to mammals and plants and the mammals include us. Genetic engineering is truly another awesome power, new power. Here I only add that for AI and genome engineering, like our evolutionary revamping of the planet, our moral and religious vocabulary by and large fails us. We have 18th, 19th and 20th century 
religion and morality, but 21st century reality. Coursing amidst this is the first theme of the letters. The first theme of the letters is the book is radical realism or radical honesty about what is actually happening to the planet and facing that. The early Anthropocene is already so baked in that coming generations simply will not escape displaced peoples, flora and fauna, and will not escape immense suffering. The violence may sometimes be slow, like sea level rise, or fast, like stronger hurricanes, stronger tornadoes, atmosphere rivers of deluge rain. But either way, fast or slow, it's violent. Nor can moral compromise be avoided. Com huge complex systems <clears throat> interacting with one another will determine futures that we cannot control. Full of wild cards that will ratchet up on uncertainty and risk, frustrate even our best intentions and assure some defeats and failures. We'll need buckets of forgiveness. Then there is the question of moral capacity itself. How do we empathize with tens of generations away? We can't know their cultures. We can't imagine their life conditions. We probably can't even speak all their languages. Yet, all that in their worlds have been shaped, has been shaped and warped by our past and our present decisions. It's impossible to see how to feel the responsibility for utterly unknown futures, even though we help create them. About this, I only have one idea. When the impact of our power shapes a world generations away, and plows as a geophysical force through ecosystems and social systems interlaced, we cannot use the moral calculus that is best known to us, namely consequences, ethics, consequences, ethics, uh, <clears throat> that is making decisions on the basis of known or likely outcomes doesn't work because we don't know the consequences multiple horizons away. The course left then is to focus on the quality of relationships rather than consequences lost to the impenetrable mists of history. And the highest quality relationships are relationships of nonviolent love precisely the kind most efficacious for a culture of nonviolence. Okay, all of this belongs to this first theme of the letters, namely radical honesty about the collective, the cumulative, and the innovative powers affecting a world that is now too small for anything but truth and too dangerous for anything but love. That's from Bill Coffin. So twice I commend James Baldwin to the grandkids. Quote, not everything that is faced can be changed, Baldwin says, but nothing can be changed that isn't faced. I spent most of my time on the Anthropocene because it's the least discussed element in the discussions going on around us. People do speak increasingly about climate catastrophe, but huge as that is, and it is huge, it's only a fractional expression of Anthropocene powers. 
Now, the second theme of the letters might surprise you. Today is Sabbath for our Jewish sisters and brothers. So I'm going to lead off with the Sabbath prayer from Reform Judaism. Quote, days pass and the years vanish, and we walk sightless among miracles. Lord, fill our eyes with seeing and our minds with knowing. Let there be moments when your presence, like lightning, illumines the darkness in which we walk. Help us to see, wherever we gaze, that the bush burns unconsumed. And we, play touched by God, will reach out for holiness and exclaim in wonder, how filled with awe is this place? And we did not know it. Amen. Among the letters, if you have a chance to see the book, read the one entitled The Kindness of Microbial Strangers, or read Ed Young's book, I Contain Multitudes, The Microbes Within Us and a Grander View of Life. Young will fill you with awe about this place that you did not know and I did not know. <clears throat> You'll understand why I say in my first letter to Eduardo, quote, what I most want for you and your baby brother is that you lose yourselves in the kaleidoscope of creation and let yourselves be overwhelmed, overwhelmed by wonder. Wonder as you wander, not to escape this harsh world, but better to inhabit it. Wondering is a way of experiencing truth. Of course, you should follow science fiercely. Tested expertise is indispensable. Yet rational analysis can miss the most essential things of life, which are bonds of love and belonging. And they are most at home in the wonder and awe that lead to knowing deeper and caring more. End of excerpt from that letter. <clears throat> the final book theme is vocation, meaning, and saying yes to life in spite of everything. I, I was thinking as I wrote this about Greta Thunberg. At 16, she, became, she began the school's strikes for climate action that became a blazing moment of world youth, and it continues. And this thrust her onto the world stage where she's been unrelenting about urgent action amidst climate calamity. Since her campaign always bore bad news about worsening reality, the climate emergency is upon us, she kept saying and keeps saying, people thought that she herself must suffer its message. What was her response? Quote, people seem to think I'm depressed or angry or worried, but that's not true. It's like I got meaning in my life. End of quote. Leading the charge in a great cause gives her deep satisfaction, even exhilaration. So <clears throat> in a letter um, titled, You Finish the Story, I wrote to Martine, or Spud, on his second birthday, quote, your vocation, your calling, your good and great work will be to remap the world on an altered earth for a different way of life in a no analog future. That relatively stable center of your grandparents, the Holocene, is now the center that no longer holds. You then are setting out on a new age of discovery and a dangerous pilgrimage. Yet you may find the meaning of that journey strangely life-giving. You may find in it the why that will not let us go 
even as you live into the unknown. You may even find unlimited enthusiasm for unprecedented challenges. I suspect you will find yourself saying yes to life in spite of everything as you help parent a world for those who follow. After all, it is not often that a chance to create a civilization comes knocking on your screen door. And the quote, quotation in that letter. These then are the themes of the letters. Radical realism and honesty about human power, wonder, and vocation meaning and saying yes to life in spite of everything. <clears throat> now let me, let me uh, finish by turning to uh, Jesus and following Jesus in a time of climate catastrophe. I'm going to cite uh, two passages in, um, about Jesus. They're not in the letters. There are things about Jesus in the letters, but these passages aren't included. About Jesus, whom Einstein incidentally refers to as the luminous figure of the Nazarene. So <clears throat> I will comment on these passages in the New Testament. First is from Matthew 5, 43 to 45, likely included Father John in your upcoming book. <clears throat> Quote, you have heard it was said, you shall love the neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be the ch children of your father in heaven. For he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. Um, note carefully that in this passage, to be children of God, means putting your enemy's welfare in the same moral framework as your own. It means seeing the other on the same terms as and with the same norms as your own. At its heart, that's very simple. It's the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do to you. Or in Wendell Berry's version, the one I prefer, do to those downstream as you would have those upstream do to you. <laughs> now, you would never accept the golden rule that said, do violently to others as you would have them do violently to you. It's, it's not coincidental that almost every culture and, and certainly every religion has some version of the golden rule. <clears throat> and here in this passage, uh, it is not stated that, that way, but that's the key to being uh, children of God, those who exercise that rule. In a word, the all-inclusive love of Jesus is nonviolence as the way of those who would be children of God. But creating this culture is hard. It's very hard. He told them a parable. This is my second passage. It's from Luke 5. No one tears a piece from a garment, and <clears throat> a new garment, and sews it on an old garment. Otherwise, the old, new will be torn, and the piece from the new will not match the old. And no one puts new wine into old wine skins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins and will be spilled, and the skins will be destroyed. But new wine must be put into fresh wine skins. And no one, after drinking old wine, desires new wine, but says, the old is good. Luke 5, 36 to 39. Now, Jesus knows 
that the times mandate new wineskins for new wine. That's transformed people and transformed institutions. Lewis and Maslin in their book, The Human Planet, How We Created the Anthropocene, outlined three possible futures for us. Continue developing our consumer capitalist mode of living is one. <clears throat> That's our late Holocene default and millions continue down the aisle behind the crucifix of capitalist progress. That's one option. Suffering widespread civilizational collapse is the second possible future. Making our dogged way to a new mode of living is the third. Now, Lewis and Maslin think that making our dogged way of living to a, in a new mode is really the only proper, prop, proper choice. They don't say it, but that's Jesus's new wineskins for new wine. But note that last line of the parable. And no one after drinking old wine desires new wine, but says the old is good. So we look with horror at climate catastrophe, and then we look away to take up where we left off, namely with the same familiar habits in the same standing institutions and structures. Evidently, Jesus thought his audience wasn't quite ready for this Jesus thing. Okay, let me finish uh, with this summary. New wineskins means in our age of unprecedented human powers, a culture of nonviolence across all relationships, human to human relationships and relationships of humans to the rest of nature. I say the rest of nature because we are nature. Are there any takers other than Jesus and maybe the Pope? So let's, let's have time to talk. And I encourage your, your comments and not just your questions. And when, when uh, Father John returns here, um, let's see if he wants to lead off. Maybe he's taking a potty break. If anyone else needs a potty break, this is a good time for it. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Larry. That was really brilliant and thoughtful and sane and life-giving and hopeful. And uh, it's one of the best reflections I've ever heard on this difficult topic. And I love so much of what you said about radical honesty. I have pages of notes um, with always lots of questions. But before I launch, let's see uh, if any other friends have questions first. So um, raise your hand and uh, let me call on you if you've got something for Larry. Otherwise, I'll start talking. And yeah, let me just make one introduction. I, I okay. noted um, one of my bonus grandkids, John Asante, but I didn't introduce his mom, mom, who is here. And maybe if I don't know if you're here for the first time, Melanie, or not, on John's series, Cornell is coming up, a friend of yours, Cornell West. Welcome, um, Melanie. Yeah, <laughs> Melanie, everybody should know, <clears throat> is the... Um, um, almost founder of what is now called eco-womanism. So after you, maybe, Melanie, you want to just say what eco-womanism is. Oh, that would be great, Melanie. Tell yeah. us everything. 
<laughs> thank you. Well, thank you so much, Papa Larry. We are so grateful to you. Dr. Larry Rasmussen is also deeply, deeply wedded in so many great relationships of love and radical love and radical honesty. So as you read the book, know that it's very true. I can testify. <laughs> he can testify as his family, how deep his love is. I am deeply grateful because I have the opportunity. John Asante, do you want to say hi to Grandpa? Hi, John Asante. <laughs> oh, thank you. So I am so thrilled to um, be one of the daughters of Larry and Nyla Rasmussen. And as you can imagine, the brilliance and the wisdom that we've all just enjoyed um, has been such a gift of path and opening for me, not just in terms of that third theme of the book, vocation, but also into this deep commitment of who many of his students, including myself, were as social ethicists and Christian ethicists. I too attended Union Theological Seminary and studied with Larry. And the gift of being there, and honestly, Larry, your work, Earth Habitat, which you write in a recent um, you know, interview um, published with, um, oh gosh, I'm forgetting the name. And you'll all forgive me, I have a four-year-old, so taking out <laughs> No, it's you're doing great. <laughs> but tell us about tell us about your book. Yeah, well, my book is Eco Womanism, and it really came into um, into fruition in part because of working with you, Larry, but also really struggling and wrestling with that uh, reality of Black liberation theology. And so James Cohn's voice was very, very deeply wedded into me as a Black liberation theologian, and of course, the tradition of womanist thought. Ecowomanism really is an approach to environmental ethics that really centers the voices of women of African descent and peoples of color. And as Larry mentioned today, the voices and the framework that come from indigenous peoples and from people of color, people who have been displaced because um, of climate change, those particular cosmologies lend a very different landscape to how we approach climate change and certainly how we approach, approach climate justice. So eco-womanism really does, yes. <laughs> it's a secret. <laughs> so, um, eco-womanism really does open up the opportunity for us to be inclusive, really, but also to really recognize the mapping of white supremacy that is on these you know, old ways of being and is wedded into the ways that we've not just approached climate, um, but also, and I so appreciate what you shared, Larry, there is a kind of willful um, ignorance that we are also this habit that you talked about that we um, have unfortunately kind of mapped into our life systems. And a part of our habit is white supremacist thinking and being. And so eco-womanism directly interrogates that and it interrogates it in such a way to really help us to pause before we actually just do environmental justice work to actually really recognize that in our human to human relationships with each other, we have not acted nonviolently and that that racial justice is a part of environmental justice and earth justice. I'm grateful, so grateful to Larry for being in my life, for being a conversation partner, um, for always including and, and being radically prophetic and including these important critiques, because that is the third way. That is the way of Christ. That is the way of nonviolence. Yeah, thank you. I, I want to well, <clears throat> say uh, thanks to Melanie on, on many counts. We had Thanksgiving together uh, last year at her mom's place in Denver. And there was um, an extra setting at the table. Uh, and so we, Nyla and I wondered who that was for, who was coming. It was for the ancestors. And they were present <laughs> in this. And let me make one addition to my comments, because I didn't spend time talking about uh, really the sources of these Anthropocene uh, powers. I talked about what they were and what their consequences are. They would not have come apart about had it not been a history that was put in place 
through slavery, through conquest, through colonization, through consumerism, and through a Western kind of Christianity that was taken to all of the places where slavery, conquest, and colonization took place. <clears throat> and this was marked by uh, the ascendancy of two things, white supremacy and what we should call, I think now, wealth supremacy. These are white originated institutions that brought about Anthropocene powers. And the Pope is right that it was a fossil fueled <laughs> uh, industrial revolution. And then that spread to all of the places that have <clears throat> been visited uh, in this process of enslaving and colonizing in process of conquest and for us an economy of unlimited uh, consumerism. I have not found a candidate, yes, and this included President Obama. I have not found a president or a candidate for that office yet that is willing to talk about anything except a, 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 an economy of growth powered by consumerism. But we, that's one of the options that Lewis and Maslin say is not a proper choice for the future of uh, us and, and other generations. Okay, I just, just to add to Melanie's remark, those remarks about how it is we got here. Well, thank you so much, Larry, and thank you so much, Melanie. Hey, everybody, don't you think it would be wonderful if we begged Melanie to do a Zoom with us some point in the future as well? I know, I, I know it would be wonderful. So, uh, Melanie, can you unmute yourself on behalf of all your friends here? Would you cordially be willing to do explain all things to us as a follow up to Reverend Larry? I would be deeply honored. Yes. Thank okay. you so much. So I will email you. I have your email now at, at, at Dr. Mel. Um, for both of you, so there was a question, Melanie in, and Larry, in the uh, chat box about environmental racism. And so mm -hmm. I would wonder if you would, um, you know, in, in anticipation of your, your own talk later, but both of you say more about that. And um, so the connection between racial justice and working for climate justice and so forth, we know it's all one. And, and also maybe any elements of the faith journey and the nonviolent Jesus in light of climate and racial justice as part of our discipleship work before us. So Melanie and Larry, I'd like you both to respond to that since somebody asked you that in whatever way you want, whatever you want to tell us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Papa, you want to go first? Um, I was going to ask the same of my daughter here, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, 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 I will say this, um, two things. Um, one is I had a wonderful sabbatical um, at Union Seminary and it was in 1999, it was a while back. And I was, I, I picked uh, different places in, uh, around the globe because they gave me some travel money. All of them were poor communities. <clears throat> and I went to them in the Philippines, in Alaska, in South Africa, in Zimbabwe, in, um, where else, Scotland maybe. I went to them because they were experiencing uh, social injustice and environmental justice together. And what I learned from that sabbatical is that there's always a link of environmental 
degradation and social injustice. Now in New York, it was right down the street where I did a, a, a course on uh, urban ecology and we went down the street um, to 125th Street, no, wherever the bus farms are. Uh, maybe it's 126th Street, um, five, six blocks away. 126th Street where the buses from a large section of Manhattan come into the bus barns and leave the bus barns for the daily, make their daily runs. Across the street from the bus barns was a large primary school. And the kids' playground was outside across the street from the big doors uh, into and out of the bus barns. The kids in that school had high levels of respiratory problems, and that had been documented. And it was the link between polluted air from, from fossil, burning fossil fuels, gas at this time. They've since made some big changes in New York, and that's one of the reasons. Um, fossil, burning fossil fuels and the kids' kids' health. Well, that was, that was because of the neighborhood and, and the location of the institutions in the neighborhood. And likewise, toxic sites are disproportionately located in poorer neighborhoods and in communities of people of color. Now in the book, you'll find that I have a major protest against using the term uh, peoples of color and not ever meaning white. That's because whites don't see themselves except as the norm or the lens through which they're viewing others. And they don't think white is a color. That's crazy. Um, <laughs> so until we also identify as peoples of color and understand what the process has been in putting environmental degradation and social injustice together, we won't get it right. Melanie, you wanna you wanna add? I'll, I'll, say, one, I'll say one more thing. A long time ago, I wrote an essay, Environmental <laughs> Justice and Environmental Racism. And I have long since forgotten about that. But I'm, I'm now um, on a website called academia.edu, a website that uploads and makes available, I don't know how many thousands of essays. The one that comes, and then they inform the author of who's look, read your essay and where are they from? And what is their name and what is who are they in terms of where they're working? The essay that most comes up under my name is environmental justice, injustice, and environmental racism. And it's from all over the world that people are reading that. Now I make, you know, I, I said I'd, lo I'd lost touch with that, but it is now on the agenda of lots of folks in lots of places. Not because I wrote it, but because of the topic. I think it's magnificent that you did write it. And I think that that's a definite um, entry. It's an invitation, I think, for all of us in terms of the anti-racist framework that environmental justice really does invite us to. It is one thing to interrogate one's white privilege. It's another thing to really learn how to be in deep relationship with lots of different people um, and people of color, but also people who have white ancestry and to really interrogate. So Ronald Takaki is a you know, famous historian 
who reminded us very deeply about the history of how America came to be. And it is often um, one of those pieces when I teach and in my pedagogy, I really do focus on many of my white students who have only known themselves as white, but they've never known the stories of immigration. They've never known the history of Irish Americans. They've never known the conflict of Irish Americans with many African American communities. And they don't realize that those particular histories are part of their own frame as people, as white people in America. So undoing this myth of whiteness as a, as a norm, as a, as a quiet norm, I think is a really important step in terms of the work of doing climate justice. I often use the story of working with um, environmental folks and in climate change work and really doing a lot of work in communities gardens and inviting people to recognize that, you know, when you volunteer to work at a garden at church or in the neighborhood, that all of the epistemologies, all of the awareness of, of racial justice, all of the awareness of climate justice that's coming into the hands and the minds of the people who are working right beside you are very different. So my history as a person of African descent coming to environmental justice work is very different than many of my white colleagues and friends. My peoples have a different relationship with the earth. Understanding that many peoples of color, particularly in the United States, but globally, truly, have a very different relationship to the earth. They understand the earth as deeply sacred. We understand the earth as deeply living, totally interconnected. So that there is not this frame or um, base of the earth as object. And I think that that base, unfortunately, that logic of domination is woven so powerfully through capitalist thinking. It's woven so powerfully, unfortunately, in American culture that that's one of the reasons why breaking the habit is so hard. Yeah. It's pretty normal. I love what you said, the shared Larry, in terms of love has the power to break. It reminds me in the African-American, a real kind of prophetic and, and um, tradition that the kind of breaking of yokes or the way that Walter Wink used to talk about, you know, engaging the powers, really engaging the kind of spiritual practices, the environmental spiritual practices that we need to do include things like church liturgy. They do include things like prayer. They do include breathing and movement that this is justice work. This is earth justice work too. And then deeply moving into radical, radical relationship, particularly around racial justice and difference. And that's not easy. Oftentimes it takes years, decades to grow in love, but we have at least that opportunity, that invitation and to be able to do so, not just interreligiously, but especially for those of us who identify with Christ and who follow Christ, to be able to share the gospel in a way that is radical, that's a gift and a deep invitation to love. Well, Melanie and Larry, thank you so much for those profound, moving reflections. So questions. Um, I want to point out what Patty said, and then I want to ask what Lynn said, and then I'm going to call on myself for two questions. So first of all, Patty is saying, hey, everybody, get Larry's book. Hey. Good suggestion, Patty. It's really beautiful, and I don't have my copy to hold up to show it. It's, you, you heard him reflect on the, the framework of letters to his grandchildren, and one of them has been on the Zoom, uh, and that's very, very powerful. I also hope, Melanie, could you type in into the chat, please, your book and uh, any more information about you and how people can get it on Echo uh, Womanism. Secondly, we're going to look at Lynn's question. And then when we get to it, I'm going to ask Larry and maybe Melanie, you can think about this too and share. I want to hear a little bit more about Jesus, and I'll tell you a little bit my thoughts on him, and then concrete steps. Now you've both given us a lot of steps and suggestions, 
But any further thoughts on that? And I think next week, Bill McKibben is just going to be all concrete <laughs> steps. Yeah. But um, so, I mean, said all that, Lynn asks a, a question here, which you both alluded to as we've talked on the consumerist culture. Lynn says, uh, she just heard this morning our economic beliefs referred to as our dominant religion. Now, she's oh. talking about the culture of greed and consumerism that's behind the destruction of everything. Do you agree with this, Larry, she's saying, the dominant religion? How can one turn the other cheek, quote, uh, in the face of these horrendous behaviors of our, of our economy, for example, for example, expanding the known toxic oil economy. Yeah. So any thoughts, Larry and Melanie, feel free to jump into. Uh, well, first of all, I just I would like to say that I largely agree that the economy, and it has been mentioned now and again, as far back as 30 years ago from Harvey Cox as the dominant uh, religion, uh, in this country. Um, and I think the, the single biggest crunch is the crunch uh, between the global human economy and nature's economy. The planet has its own economy. Um, it knows what to do with waste, for example. It, waste becomes food or some, something else uh, in, in nature's economy. But the crunch is between uh, this uh, global economy of consumerism and uh, the economy of nature or the planet's uh, economy. And one of the beauties of eco-science uh, is that we see more and more of the actual working of the of nature's kind of economy. Um, that said, uh, I just finished uh, reading Tara Rowe's book and wrote a review of it. Um, of modern extraction is the title of it, and it's a history of uh, extraction, uh, an extractive economy, and she goes. Uh, back a long ways in dealing with that. But the, the thing that strikes me so much about Tara Rowe's book is that she also points to the fact that there are all kinds of economies, and Melanie alluded to some of them, all kinds of economies, and I'm thinking of the economies of indigenous peoples that are not consumerist growth economies. Um, if, you, if you are a fan of Robin Wall Kimmerer's braiding sweetgrass, you will see a description of an alternative economy where you don't take more than you need. Uh, it's, it simply isn't growth oriented, it's harmony oriented, mm -hmm. it's sufficiency for all oriented. Um, so that's one thing. The other good news is that there are lots of economists who are struggling to find an alternative to our kind of global economy. We don't have politicians yet that are rallying around uh, the new work done by lots of uh, economists who are the people that are probably tuned best to figuring out the dynamics and how, how you might scale up these things. But regenerative agriculture is a movement within agriculture uh, as an alternative to mass industrialized agriculture. And there are lots of places that are working at this. Santa Fe has one of the best, you always um, listed among the top 10 farmers markets in the United States. And those folks 
uh, who bring their goods to Santa Fe often have to have a second job because what they make on their their little uh, acreage and bring to Santa Fe isn't enough for their living. But many of them are committed to what is as a movement called regenerative agriculture. And it's an explicit alternative to the way that most food is uh, raised and, and, and consumed. Um, so economists working on an alternative, indigenous peoples longing, having long had an alternative uh, and um, regenerative agriculture are just some examples of things which are going on right now, have committed um, clientele and um, expertise. Melanie, you want to add anything? You know, I will just remind us about the powerful work of Fannie Lou Hamer, and you all probably remember that it was really her voice during the civil rights movement who really brought new awareness about the levels of poverty and economic injustice happening in Mississippi and most of the southern United States of America. At that time, she was a really powerful voice, um, along with King and so many others leaders, but because she was a woman, there were lots of spaces where she encountered patriarchy and basic sexism. And by the time that her life, um, around 1970 and 1971, by the time she was taking a real deep turn in her life, she recognized that the only way to really create justice was to create opportunities for people to have their own food. And that real big movement of developing farming communities and co-ops began with her um, really allowing Black families to have one pig and a little bit of land and enough to be able to grow to feed themselves and to feed the community. So any extra was really given and grown as a way of producing life in their own community. Her freedom farms really is one of the most important models that we have, and it is not based on how much money you have. It is based on the communities that you're willing to participate in and that you're willing to share with. For her, I think coming into the reality of racial justice, coming to the reality of really confronting white supremacy, her Christianity, her faith, her belief in what Larry, you shared today and forgiving the enemy, um, that was really an important part of her theology. It was important to be able to learn how to be able to walk with and to feed the other um, and to consider the life of the other as important as the stomachs of the other, as important as her own stomach. Um, that radical way of being, that radical way of being a Christian, I think is one of the most important models that we have. Um, mm -hmm. And the fact that she was, she believed in community where she didn't believe in classist community. And if you had enough money that you could belong to a church or if you could belong to a community that no, everyone was welcome and everyone who was hungry ate. Well, thank you so much, Melanie. And thank you, Larry. Um, so with just a few minutes left, I'm gonna ask you my two questions now. And one is any your thoughts, more thoughts on Jesus and the Gospels and concrete next steps. And you see, by the way, folks, that we have Melanie's great book from Orbis Books, Echo Womanism, African American Women and Earth Honoring Faiths. It's listed in the chat box. And Larry's book, as you know, is um, The Planet. Uh, planet You Inherit. The Planet You Inherit, which is letters to his grandkids. So, um, Larry and Melanie, I wrote a book which five years, seven years ago, was trying to reflect on the gospel and climate change. And so I, I, I want to, any more specific thoughts about the gospels for clues about going forward? For me, here's three little ones. Larry, you brought up love your enemies. And I always say that that verse besides being the most political statement of the Bible, is the clearest description of the nature of the mystery of God in the Bible. Oh. But what's so interesting, and you're bringing it up on a Zoom about climate change, is 
Jesus describes God in terms of nature. Yeah. And you didn't mention that sun no, and the, right. that sun and rain. Yeah. To understand yeah. God, all you have to do is look at the sun and think about the rain. It's universal love. Wow. Secondly, uh, my whole book was about the third beatitude. Blessed are the meek. And I, if you have any thoughts on this, you all, uh, which Merton says is the biblical word for kingy and nonviolence. And Jesus unites nonviolence with creation, which is very weird. Blessed are the people of creative nonviolence. They shall be one with creation. They will inherit the earth. And because we're people of total violence, we're not one with the earth, or most of us, most white people for sure. So that's powerful. And the third is... Um, well, you may say I'm really nuts or goofy, but I wrote about it. I think it's very mysterious, the, the parable of Jesus calming the storm. You know, he's asleep in the boat and there's storm breaking out, all hell is breaking loose and they wake him, don't you care about us? And he just calms the storm. And is there a lesson there? Um, I, I, I've... I've concluded in my book that, Larry, that as we're moving toward King's vision of a culture of nonviolence, it means really practicing eschatological nonviolence, that forget nationalism, besides racism and consumerism, we are now living completely in the reign of God and all its political, social, economic, racial, environmental implications. So thoughts on Jesus and any concrete next steps, a little concrete for us on the Zoom, Larry and Melanie. Um, uh, your connections of Jesus and creation, and of course, talking about, always getting his examples from, yeah. from creation, whether it's in the parables or in <clears throat> uh, other teaching just brings to mind something that is um, I'm finding is a rereading of the whole of scripture, namely, how do you read scripture from an indigenous people's point of view? And when you start going down that road, there isn't anything that isn't that. I mean, first of all, just to start with Genesis, um, human beings are uh, created on the sixth day. The sixth day isn't a day for humans by themselves. We don't get a day by ourselves. We're created on all mammal day and we're kin with the rest of them. And what happens uh, when Cain kills Abel and uh, Cain's um, <clears throat> eviction from the garden. Mm -hmm. And he says, this is, I can't bear this. Why is it? It's because he is, it's because Adama. Adam is created from Adama. It's a Hebrew pun. Earthling human beings are created from, we're, we're dust and mud people in our origins. And Cain said, well, who cries out when Cain kills Abel? Go back and take a look at that in Genesis 4. You'd, you'd expect Adam and Eve to cry out. It is not Adam and Eve. It's Adama. It's the ground cries out when human blood is spilled. On it, in it instead of water. <laughs> what it, it was supposed to receive water, and they got human blood. And the, and and Cain is uh, expelled, and he says it's a burden too great for me to bear. He can't be divorced from his origins. Dust. Well, thank you. And the and the breath and the breath of God is the breath of God for all life on too. And it's not just breathed into humans. And in Hebrew, there is no Hebrew word for humans 
as a separate species. It doesn't exist in the language itself. That's, that's amazing. Now, Jesus is drawing on this tradition of Adam, Adama, and God's, Thomas Berry is right, God's primary revolution, revelation is the universe itself. That's the text without a greater context. Scripture is a secondary one. Uh, so Jesus is always drawing upon this. But I, I just wanted to say, uh, and it's in keeping with Melanie's comment about Fannie Lou Hamer, and I didn't know that about Fannie Lou Hamer. And, but your, your comments at, at, at the conclusion there about community. One thing I've never um, pursued, and maybe you have, John, um, is why is it that uh, you go from Jesus and the experience of Jesus's resurrection to the creation of communities where everything is shared? Mm -hmm. I mean, the primary example of uh, community uh, where, <clears throat> where all things are shared are the earliest Christian communities, household communities, where uh, everything is, is shared. How we make that move or how, how we see that happening has got to be an important link to the experience that Jesus is still among them. Mm. The resurrection is that the spirit has never left. Mm. And if you want to know the language that ties all of our communities together across religious lines, the one common denominator is spirit. Mm -hmm. And it, that goes along with an indigenous, an indigenous people's perspective that all of earth is filled with spirit. Mm. It includes rocks, <laughs> as well as trees, as well as living uh, creatures. There's the common element. Now, what is it in the experience of Jesus's resurrection as the spirit still among them led them to community as the place where we share all things? Now, in this society, that doesn't go very far because we are individualistic. Uh, not, not every community, and Melanie has described those that aren't, but but basically, capitalism wants you to be consider yourself as an individual and as a consumer. And so we start talking about sharing things, and that reverts to, well, did I agree to that or not? <laughs> I, rather than what is the common good. Thank you, Larry. Mel, uh, we're coming to the end of our time. Melanie, any further thoughts? Thank you. It was in Larry's book, Earth Community, that I began for the first time to see the connections between womanist thought and environmental justice. And Larry did a great job of um, really recounting the story and the poetic voice of Alice Walker in The Color Purple, whereby Suge makes an observation as a character in the book she says that when a tree is cut, my arm bleeds. Yeah. This particular phrase is so important because it really does um, allow us to imagine, but also be with the depth of interconnectedness that we have and share. I agree so much, well, Larry, with what you've just said in terms of the kind of across religious um, life, across religious practices, across religions. And if, in even the practice of intra-religious, right? I think I teach a generation of students and most students um, who are undergraduate ages kind of 19 to, to 30 at this point 
Um, some of them very much identify as spiritual, but not religious. Yeah. And many, as you mentioned, you know, I think with the climate reality, there is a reality also of mental health that we are looking at and facing right now, no matter where we are on the planet. Some of that's pandemic related, but a lot of that is just recognizing that mental health, particularly around young people, is so important to be paying attention to right now. There are strategies and rituals in our own tradition, in Christianity, but all religious traditions. It, it invites me to recognize the tradition um, of breathing, of Christian meditation, of the peace of Christ, literally, you know, going back to John and, and realizing again, Larry, what you just said, that there is something really important about the moment of the resurrection of Jesus was the moment where we recognize that an advocate had already been sent, that the Holy Spirit, <clears throat> that she had already been sent to be with us and to connect us and to keep us connected and that the peace of Christ that Christ leaves with us is already here, already present. That present, being in the present moment, is a deep echo of what Thich Nhat Hanh spent his entire life trying to teach us. To be fully present in the present moment is to experience the reality of peace and in Buddhism, the reality of Buddha nature. So when we think about Buddhism and we think about even the stories and the sacred texts and the poems written by Buddhist nuns, we are reminded that the moment that the Buddha came into full enlightenment really was the moment that he touched earth. Hmm. Bell Hooks reminds us in her wonderful book, um, Sisters of the Yam, and this extraordinary essay, Touching the Earth, that there is something deeply sacred and healing about literally touching the earth, that one can only come into the fullness of enlightenment, the fullness of peace, by actually touching the, touching the earth. It is instructive then that Bell Hooks, Alice Walker, Tina Turner, so many were able to see this union of thought between Buddhism and Christianity, Thomas Berry, and use these practices as a way of centering their own environmental, their own ecological commitment to see the earth as sacred and to live counterculturally, to not be individualistic and to have these extraordinary lives with chosen family, with radical ways of being, with church family that are not normal church, <laughs> that are not normal community but to actually extend ourselves with the same basis that we have been taught to love and to practice. And yes, we will make a lot of mistakes. I, I can tell you, I've made a lot of mistakes with Papa Larry and Mom and I. I've made a lot of mistakes. But we have been committed in love to build out an anti-racist family. And that helps the planet. Amen. Well, thank you both so much. Wow. Um, dear friends, how about a show of applause for Larry for his brilliant reflection? And then the special yeah. added bonus of having Melanie here with us, these two great environmentalists and authors. Larry, was so grateful for all the thought and preparation you put in. It was very moving and helpful to me. And Melanie, thank you for being here with us too and for agreeing to do a Zoom some point in the future. Um, that would be totally wonderful and I hope everyone will join us. So as uh, you know, in closing, let me just for a little uh, advertisement about the Beatitude Center. Next week, Bill McKibben will be here. To my mind, I, I sort of saw these all as one, but now we're gonna have Melanie come on at some other day, point two. Uh, please join us next week, register and try to get five other friends to register. And if anybody needs a scholarship, no problem, we'll give it to them. We want people to, to hear Bill. I'm gonna be sending out uh, the recording of this program. Eventually it'll be on YouTube and when it's there someday on our free channel, please share it with everybody what we heard. Please get Larry and Melanie's books if you can. And, um, just so you know, in July, we have my friend, Joe, Father Joe Brown, talking about uh, following Jesus and working for racial equality and justice. Medea Benjamin, then, on the war in Ukraine. 
Mm. Zugby Zugby, one of the greatest voices of nonviolence in Palestine, coming to us live from Bethlehem in August. Our friend, Dr. Cornell West, uh, who's running for president, will be here on September 9th. And Adam Bucko, talking about engaged contemplation on September 23rd. Dr. Catherine Meeks, one of the leading voices on racial healing, justice, and reconciliation, will be here in October. And then as we go to Christmas, we'll have um, Jonathan Montaldo on Merton and, and, and hopefully brother David Stendel Ross live coming to us from Salzburg, Austria at Christmas. It's an amazing lineup. And yes. so please support, do what you can to help support the Beatitude Center. Tell everybody, Melanie, tell everybody at Union for me if you can. And Larry, tell all your friends about the Beatitude Center. Uh, for those who are watching online on uh, YouTube, uh, today I'm grieving the loss of my longtime friend, Daniel Ellsberg. And those of you who are watching, uh, I've written a long reflection about Dan, which will be on the National Catholic Reporter website later today that you might be interested in reading. Great voice for peace and, um, and against war. So on that note, a great big thank you again to Larry and to Melanie, and thank you all for being here with us. This was very inspiring. I'm going to sign off now, but if you want to stay on for a few more minutes, you're very welcome. God bless everybody. Take care and go in the peace of Christ to live in the wonder of creation and make peace with one and all. God bless you all. Thanks. Amen.